Hope is a good thing, right? Uh, I want to talk a little bit today about how we use the word hope, and hopefully we can, hopefully, we can gain a little better understanding of what it means and how impacting the word hope is for us and how God being our hope, how it truly should transform our lives. You, know, you hear me say that a lot, but there's, there's different characteristics about who God is, and every single one carries a weight and a magnitude with it that should at some point change our lives and how we think. Um, how, how many of you guys realize that, that um, our lives a lot of times are driven by our brain? You know, our, what we think is what we do. What we think is how we perceive the world around us. And so when we, when we talk about these characteristics of who God is, each one carries a new weight and a new uh, dynamic, new dimension that really should transform the way we think and therefore change our lives dramatically because God is limitless. God is so far greater beyond... Did I do that? Why are you guys reading that? I, that was an accident. Um... God is so far uh, greater and bigger beyond our imagination, beyond our expectation, that uh, every, anytime we, we learn something about God, it should transform our lives. That's why the Word of God is transcending of time. This, this book right here, um, though maybe it wasn't written to us, will be for us for generations upon generations upon generations, and it will still bring life to you every time you read it. Maybe not, maybe not consciously, but when you, I'm telling you, you can read the book of Leviticus, or you can read the book of, who, who knows what, one of those books that are really difficult to understand, and supernaturally, the life of God is being placed inside of us because it is the word of God that we are taking in, okay? It's like, you, you know, you might eat something, take a piece of bread, or something that's kind of, you know, you, you eat it and you're not like, wow, okay, that was an amazing meal, Okay, it may not have been an amazing meal, but what, it's still replenishing your system. It's still giving you food. And that's when we read the Bible, we, we read the Word of God, something supernatural happens that it just feeds us, even if we don't have this massive revelation. Um, but that's why it's good to have a habit of taking in the Word of God. Um, I want to start in the book of Psalms today, and I think, do I have that one up? Yeah, so you don't have to turn to it if you don't want to. Um, we're going to read this psalm, um, and this is a psalm of David, uh, and this, David was in distress at the time of writing this passage. They don't really know why. Um, they think, there's some people that believe that he might have had a close friend that passed away, um, but they don't really know why, but it is obvious that David uh, was in a time of distress when writing this, and it says, I said, I will guard my ways that I might not sin, I may not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth with a muzzle so long as the wicked are in my presence. I was mute and silent. Silent. I held my peace to no avail, and my distress grew worse. My heart became hot within me. As I mused, the fire burned, and then I spoke with my tongue. So you can kind of see the distress of David coming out, but then he realized he's, he's coming to this point. There's going to be a couple, uh, just in this passage, there's going to be a couple... Um, Oh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, turning points. Uh, and just in this passage alone, right there is a turning point. So he, he talks about how distressed he is. And this is a little bit of a turning point. He says, but then I spoke with my tongue. O oh Lord, make me know my end. And what is the measure of my days? Let me know how fleeting I am. Behold, you have made my days a few hand breaths, and my lifetime is as nothing before you. Surely all mankind stands as a mere breath. Surely a man goes about as a shadow. Surely for nothing they are in turmoil. Man heats up heaps of wealth and does not know who will gather. And now, O oh Lord, for what do I wait? And, and this is actually uh, Psalm 39, 1 through 7a. And I'm going to turn the slide, and there's going to be the last uh, line of 7B. But this is another turning point right before we get to the next page. And um, so what is he saying here? So first you see the, the great distress. Then he, he goes into this passage, and he says, basically, what is, what is life? It's pointless, right? 
I mean, I mean, you look at God, my, my life is a shadow compared uh, to God. My, um, you have made my days a few hampers. My lifetime is as nothing before you. Um, and it talks about, surely for nothing, men are in tur- turmoil and they heap up wealth, not knowing who will gather it. And Lord, for what do I wait? Saying like, there's, there's nothing in this life for me. There's nothing in this life for me. But my hope is in you. <clears throat> David's saying, in light of all that, this you know, crappy situation that I'm in, um, I'm distressed, I'm frustrated. Um, and how many, I, I know probably a lot of you, I do this, but in times of crisis, it may not be crisis in my own life, but it might be somebody, an acquaintance or a friend of mine has a friend who passed away or who's really sick, terminally ill, whatever. Uh, in those times, we at least take a few moments and reflect on our own life, don't we? I mean, just naturally, it kind of naturally occurs. I mean, if I hear of somebody whose daughter, something bad happened to their daughter, I, at least for a few moments, reflect a little bit on my daughter, right? Or you know, something happens to your dad or your grandpa, same thing applies, right? We at least take a few moments and reflect on that in our own personal life. And I think this is what David uh, is doing this. He's saying, he's kind of, he realizes this is a situation that he's in, uh, and then he starts to reflect on the point of life, and he starts to reflect on his own life, and he says, in light of all of that, I realize that it is frivolous, insignificant, meaningless, to put my hope into anything but you. Okay? That's what, that's what he's saying here. That, that's how I'm interpreting it. Um, and I usually am right. Um, but there is other passages that are similar to this. This is not just David. I mean, I'm sure some of you are thinking about Solomon right now in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Uh, uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Let's go there. If you have your Bibles, turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. And I'm going to read this super fast. I am a pretty fast reader. Um, there's a lot of things I'm good at. I'm just sorry. I'm, I'm done. I'm not going to say that anymore. I, I really don't have that great of a, self, a huge self-esteem. I just um, Okay, but I'm going to read this really fast because you guys will get the idea. Uh, the words of the preacher, the son of David... King in Jerusalem, vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What does man gain from all the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. Around and around goes the wind, and on its circuits the wind returns. All streams run into the sea, but the sea is not full to the place where the streams flow. There There they flow again. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. Okay, basically saying here, there's nothing new. This, everything that I experience has been experienced before. What is my life? What, what significance does my life have? There is no rem- oh, where am I at? Verse 10. Is there such a thing of what it says, see, this is new? It has been already. And this is way back in the day. This is a long time ago. And so uh, how much more uh, does this mean for us? Um, It has been already in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after. See, he's predicting that already. I, the preacher, have been king over Israel and Jerusalem, and I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity, and not just that, it's a striving after the wind. Try and go catch the wind. See see if you have success. There's no point. Nothing is new, okay? Okay? And then he goes to talk about the vanity of self-indulgence in chapter 2. I'm not going to read that. The vanity of, living, uh, of, of wise living. Uh, now, this is, now, let me just say this. This is Solomon kind of on a soapbox here. Okay? You know, he's, he's, 
You know, he's, he's probably talking. I mean, this dude is wise. Okay, he's the wisest man that ever lived. And he's talking about the vanity of wisdom. Okay, um, so he's... Ultimately, what, what this is getting at is that there is... We're, we're in this life, and, and nothing new is happening in this life. There's, there's, there's repeat, repeat, generation after generation has all experienced the same things. And nothing is new, and nothing is worth um, uh, collecting, storing up treasures on this earth. There's one other passage... In James chapter 4, he kind of says the same thing. He says, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Okay, so I read all those just to say there are several people in the Bible that are realizing and they have come to this place, this, uh, you know, this, uh, I don't know, part of their journey, this path that they're saying, I mean, what do I do? Should I just, I mean, because there's really nothing, there's no point in living. There's, life is meaningless. Okay. So my question is, I, and I know we all know the answer to this, I, it's, is it bad to hope for things on this earth? Is it bad to hope that my kids can have good grades? Is it bad to hope that my, um, you know, that I'll make a good sale and I'll get a raise? And is it bad to hope for those things? I don't think so. Um, but we're gonna we're talking about different kinds of hope here, and I got this from Rick Warren. I can't take credit for it. Um, and but this is really really good because. It'll kind of, we're going to be able, able to tell a little bit of the difference, even in passages in the Bible, they use the word hope, and it's, again, it's, the word hope is translated into different things because the Hebrew and Greek languages were a lot more expressive, a lot more detailed than the English languages. So you've got several words that kind of mean the same thing. But there's three different kinds of hope. One is a wishful hope, and this is the kind of hope that most people use on a day-to-day basis. This is, in your verbiage, when you use the word, I hope, and finish the sentence, this is probably, most likely, um, the kind of hope that you are doing. So this is like, I hope my kid's good at I hope my kid, I hope I pass this test. I hope uh, my boss likes my presentation. I hope, okay, that actually, that last one is actually expectant hope. Possibly, and I'll tell you why. But I hope that, um, you guys know what I'm saying. I hope that, uh, oh, come on, I'm just, what are some of the things you guys hope for? Okay, hope it doesn't rain today. There's nothing you can do, okay? You are not God. There's nothing you can do. Or, I hope it does rain. How many farmers have said that before? Okay, so I'm going to go into expectant hope. This is hope that you've actually put some time and energy into something. Um, the first one, you have absolutely no control over. Wishful hope, you have no control over. Second one, you do have some control over. So I'm going to go back to farmers. Uh, Jeff and Steve and Mike and uh, who else is John Miller and I don't know, there's quite a few farmers in here. Mark Whitmer, he's not here today. Who else is a farmer in here? Okay, I didn't miss anybody. Um, okay, so this is expectant hope. So basically, you do what you can. There is effort and energy that you put in to uh, seeing something you, that you hope to happen. So, um, you know, you can't just take a handful of corn seed and just throw it out there and leave it there for four months and, you know, hope that something happens. Uh, you are actually spending time working on your tractors. You're spending time uh, making sure your rows are straight. Um, killing the weeds, whatever you need to do, right? I'm talking farmer here, and I'm, I'm going to make a fool of myself if I keep going. Um, but uh, there is a, a little bit of an expectation that goes along with, their, with that hope, that if you do your job well, even though you can't 100% guarantee it, it's, uh, there's a little bit of an expectation there that, that, um, that we have. Okay, so then um, there's the certain hope. And our certain hope is Jesus. Um, 
By the way, let me go back to expectant hope. This is another example of expectant hope that I missed, is uh, pregnancies. Right? So there's an expectation when you have a pregnancy, when you become pregnant, when a woman becomes pregnant, that you're going to birth a baby, it's going to be a healthy baby, and, right, there's, there's, that, that, there's that hope. But as much as you can do to take care of your own body, there is part of that. You have to take care of your own body because, you know, if you're, you're taking drugs, you're doing what you're not supposed to be doing, um, you can't have expect that expectation or you can't have that hope. But if you're doing all that, you, all that you can to make sure that your part is done and you, your part to make sure that your baby's healthy, there's still this uncertainty that happens. You know, and, and there's people in this room that have experienced that, okay? There's, there is an uncertainty that you have no control over. And then there's a certain hope. You build your life on this hope. You anchor your soul on this hope. There's no hesitation. There's no reservation. There's no uncertainty. See, faith and hope go hand in hand. You can't have faith without this hope. We have faith because we have hope. Our God is a living God. He gives life to the fullest. He lives now and forevermore. Our God is king, eternal. He reigns forevermore. Our God has defeated sin, hell, and death. And that is our hope. We have faith because we hold on to that hope of those things that I just mentioned. Um, I love this passage in Hebrews. It's, um, it's in Hebrews chapter 10. You don't have to go there. I'm just going to read it. And it's, it's a call. It's a, a, uh, it's a call to persevere in the faith. It's, it's, a, it's a summoning. It's a mobilizing plea saying, come on, uh, you can do this. This is what it says. Listen very carefully. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, Jesus is our great priest. I want to stop there before I read the rest of the passage. This is important because Jesus has, uh, what was the high priest's responsibility back in the Old Testament? Someone? Intercession, okay, they were the mediator, right, between God and man, okay? And Jesus came and bridged the gap, you guys know this, bridged the gap between sin, death, ugly things, and perfection, holiness. And Jesus came and bridged that gap, and he, therefore, is our high priest And it says, since we have a great high priest over the house of God, and because Jesus did that, because Jesus is now our high priest, and anybody can approach God through Jesus, this is where it gets good in this passage. Then let us draw near to God, because we can. It doesn't say that, but I'm just saying that. Because we can, because of what Jesus did, this call, this this, uh, summoning, this mobilizing plea is saying, Since we can, since Jesus did this for us, he did the hard work, the impossible work, really, that only one person could ever do. But since he did that for us, don't sit on your butt. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings. Having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. He's saying, don't... Don't sit, don't stay in your sin because of what Jesus did for us. He is the high priest. We can draw near to God. We can leave our sin, even though we'll fall. We can get back up. We can dust ourselves off and we can pursue God with all zeal, fervor, energy, and passion. So let us do that. Even though we have Guilty consciousness, even though we have, we need our bodies washed um, because we have, have a, 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 an enemy and he likes to pull us down. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, but let us hold unswervingly 
to the hope we profess. So he's saying, get up, pursue God because you can, because of what Jesus did. Get up and pursue and hold unswervingly to the hope that's in Christ. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider, and this is where it goes, it doesn't stop there. So it says, pursue, get up and pursue. Go after it, draw near to God, because you can. And then it says, and let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing. And so, I, let me just stop there. I know some people that say, I don't need to go to church. I, me and God are good. We're good. I don't need to go to church. No, you do. You do. No one in here is an island. We were never destined to be an island. We were always meant to be in community with other people, plugged in. Um, but encouraging one another. He's saying, so I'm going to go back once again. Jesus did this. Jesus, he did it for you. The hard work is done. All you need to do is get off your butt, draw near to God. Draw near to God. And and, and James, it says draw near to God, then God will draw near to you. God wants us to draw first. I mean, think about it. You parents out there, I mean... You want, okay, so I'm trying, this is an example, I'm just pulling out of nowhere here, but, uh, so I might struggle through it. Um, so like, you know, you want your, your kids to experience things, so, you know, uh, let's say, instead of sitting in front of the TV playing video games, okay, why don't you take out a piece of paper and, and draw, you know, express your creativity on the paper. I never did that, but maybe some kids do that, and that's good. I'm sure, I'm sure Becca and Cody and all those other people that are way more artistically gifted than I am um, have done that. But listen, um, we could get out the paper for Asher or Bo or anyone and say, okay, here you go. I, I did some of the work for you. Well, we could also get out the markers. Okay, here you go. Here's the markers. We could al- also pull up a desk and a chair. But s- they need to do something. They need to have some investment. And this is, I think, what, 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 what we're saying here is that Jesus did the hard work. I think part of, the, part of the heart behind draw near to God and then God will draw near to you is saying you got to do something. Jesus did all of this. The least you can do is get off your butt. I know I'm saying that a lot. I won't say it anymore. But get up and pursue. Do something. Okay? Do something. Um. And don't give up meeting together because that's important. And encourage one another. Okay, so it's not this, I know I'm staying staying on this passage a lot because I really like it, but it's not just about what God did for me. Yes, that's the hard part. And shame on me if I don't respond and draw near to him because of what he's done for me. Shame on me. But not only that, that shouldn't even be a thought. You know, that should be just a natural response. Go, follow Jesus. So that should just be natural. But then he says, maybe what you need a little more encouragement with is saying exactly what I'm telling you, tell other people. Encourage them. Be plugged in. Be a part of a community. Um, Okay. Uh, I read this online. Uh, A guy by the name of Jack Wellman. I have no idea who he is, but I thought I should cite him. Um, Hope is the knowledge of facts. This is this is tells you a little bit more of the differences between the hopes. The three hopes that we're talking about. This is the certain hope. Hope is the knowledge of facts. We don't think about that, right? When we think about the word hope and the way we use it in our conversation, it's things that possibly could happen if the right scenario came to play, right? That's kind of what we look at. If If the cards were dealt in the right way, the weather cooperates, you know, that's what our hopes are based on, right? This hope is the knowledge of facts. If someone says to you that I hope you have a good day, there's no guarantee that the day will go well. To have a biblical hope is to have a sure anchor for the soul. 
not hoping for rain, which is what we talked about, because the forecast says there's a 60% chance of rain, and you hope that you get your garden watered. That is not hope. That is wishful thinking. (laughs) And it is utterly undependable and has no power to bring anything to pass. Human hope pales in comparison to biblical hope. I want to talk a little bit about um, this hope. This passage um, is an anchor. is in Hebrews chapter 6. You guys heard that phrase before Before I started saying it? Hope is an anchor for my soul. Uh, I, I love that wording, okay? Um, actually, in a lot of worship songs, it's almost, it's almost a funny spoof among worship leaders now because in, you have to, if you're going to write a good worship song, you have to have some sort of water references um, because so many worship songs right now are have to do with uh, storms and, you know, you know. Um, but this hope is an anchor for my soul. Um, Hebrews 6, why don't, we, why don't we go there? Hebrews 6 chapter, I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 6 verse 19. Okay. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. So what does sure mean? S-U-R-E, not S-H-O-R-E. Sure. This, what? Definite, yep, what? Positive, unquestionable, okay, good. Uh, We have this as a sure, and, I lost my spot here. Steadfast, what does steadfast mean? Unmoving, yeah, what? Always there, yeah, any other thoughts? What? Constant, what? You guys don't fight. You both have good answers here. You said earth? Oh, firm. Like earth. How am I going to throw that one in there? Um, yeah, so constant. That's, that's kind of Katie's. I'm, I'm agreeing with Katie here. I'm agreeing with all of you, but um, that word constant. So it's this sure, this definite, unquestionable, um, reliable, but it's also constant. It's like not just for this moment, but it's steadfast, ongoing to the end of time. So we have the sure and steadfast uh, anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. On our behalf, having become a high priest forever. Okay, so... um, Purposes of an anchor. I wonder what's in my next slide here. Oh, I did that one. All right. No more slides for you. Um, what are purposes for an anchor? What? Go ahead, Joyce. Hold steady. Hold steady. Secure. Secure. Okay, I've got two, and I think those are uh, both hitting on it. One is a, it keeps a ship or a boat from drifting. So how many have been in a boat? So Ryan Wellman, you've been on a boat. Do you, when you're fishing, fishing in, um, in the ocean down in Bama, um, do you use an anchor or not? Sometimes. Okay, what is the purpose of using an anchor when you're fishing in Bama? Okay, so, yeah, it's to keep you from drifting. And the other thing is stability in a storm, Right? So um, those are the two main uh, reasons for an anchor. And there's a reason he uses this terminology. We need anchors for our souls, don't we? It's so easy to drift. And I believe that this is one of the biggest tools, uh, deceptions of the enemy. Um, because sometimes he doesn't just hit us with something, you know, and we, we, we like, all of a sudden we're super close to God, and then all of a sudden the next minute we're, you know, so far away from the Lord that, you know, it doesn't happen like this. It's, it's this little drifting away, uh, wave after wave. And um, it's really easy to do. So, uh, all, how many of you have ever been in a situation where you, you've all of a sudden are saying, where, where am I? How did I get here? Um, what am I doing here? Have you ever said these things? It's... It's this uh, little by little, um, temptation after temptation that, that the enemy just waves in front of our face and says, 
uh, if I get you to, to mess up in this little area, if I get you to say this, this one little thing to your kids or your coworkers that is not representative of who God is, then maybe next time I can get them to do something a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, and, and all in the meanwhile, just separating yourself. from. Remember, God, um, it, you're either pursuing God or you're going the other way. There's no staying in the same place. You're either uh, you're pursuing God or you're backsliding, basically, Okay. And so the enemy's goal is to get little by little. How can I get this person little by little to just a little bit separate themselves uh, from, from God? <clears throat> um, I'm going to look real quickly at a, a passage in John chapter 4, and I'm not going to read it because I've read quite a bit. But this, um, this is one of the miracles of Jesus is, is when he uh, heals a royal official's son. And I want to look at this in a little different way. Um, uh, Jesus was visiting Galilee. And um, I'm just going to read a little bit. So just that it gives us a little bit of a context of the story. Um, uh, a royal official went to Cana when he heard that Jesus was there and begged Jesus to heal his son. Okay, so this royal official, the son's not there, right? But the royal official is coming to Jesus and begging him to heal his son, who was at the point of death. Jesus told the man that his son would live. Um, Once more he visited Cana, uh, where Jesus turned the water into wine before, and um, there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum again. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son, who his son was close to death. The royal official said, Sir, come down before my child dies. And Jesus replied, your son will live. Um, so, long story short, right, they found out that right when Jesus said, your son will live is when the son uh, got healed. Okay? But what I want to look at here is a little different. And I think part of Jesus' mission while he was on this earth was to show people how it, it was so easy to place our hope in much less significant things. And what I mean by much less significant things is, and this is it's not going to sound insignificant, but hopefully you, you get the um, contrast here. But in this story, the much less significant thing is the healing of this guy's son. I mean, think about all the miracles of Jesus feeding the 5,000, healing the lepers. These are all, these all pale in significance to what Jesus did for us and the hope that he gave us by defeating sin and death on the cross and allowing us to have access to the Father. And those don't sound like small things. But what I want to get at is where, is our, where does our hope lie? I believe it's fine, again, to have... You know, our earthly hopes. We all have earthly hopes, and that's okay. We hope that our son and daughter stay healthy. We hope that, uh, you know, again, we get, we, get, uh, we get a raise. We, you know, we hope our crop has a, a great harvest season. You know, we, um, we hope that we make a certain amount of money. Okay, but what I'm trying to get at is those, we have to understand that those hopes are very very insignificant compared to the hope that is an anchor for our souls in Jesus Christ. Pales in significance. And it's, it's difficult sometimes to... Because some, sometimes these hopes are very close to our hearts. I mean, think about it. And, I know I go to this example a lot it's just because I'm, you know, I'm a dad of four children. So a lot of my hopes have to do with my kids. And so those are very dear to my heart. But, like, hoping that my, my, my kids have married uh, men and women of God. Um, man and women of God. Um, but still... Still, that pales in comparison to the anchor of my soul. Uh, 
Um, the royal official in this passage was hoping that Jesus would heal his son. How many of you would hope that in, if you were in that scenario and you, saw G, you heard that Jesus was coming to town, I mean, I would be, if my, if my son or my daughter is sick, terminally ill, and I know that Jesus who does miracles and who has a history of just healing people left and right, I am bursting at the seams. I am going with all fervor and all energy to that person, and I'm saying, come heal my son. But Jesus says, listen to, listen to what Jesus says, and, and we don't catch this in the first time we read uh, through this passage. Unless you people see signs and wonders, you'll never believe. Gee, I believe Jesus wanted to heal. I believe God wants good things to happen to us, but not at the cost of us focusing on those more than we focus on him. Um, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will never believe. He's saying, you're focusing on the wrong thing. Yes, you had the faith to believe that I could do this, and that's a good thing. But there still was this uncertainty, this hesitancy. And if if you grab onto the hope that is an anchor for your soul, there will be no uncertainty, there will be no reservations, there will be no hesitations. Um, And there's other stories. Um, People, all of us, from day one, have been more concerned with what God can do for us than what he already did for us. It's just, it's, it's the story from day one. I mean, look at the Israelites and their journey. Over and over again, more concerned with, with God providing for their next temporary need than, than what he was in the process of doing. Um, this is tough to be able to do, though. I have so many earthly hopes. I do. I need to remind myself that God is my hope. There is a hope that doesn't change. There is a hope we can cling to. God wants, you know, I, I said this, God wants to give us good things. I believe that, but first we place our hope in him, this certain hope. And that has to take priority and precedence over our wishful hopes. Wishful hopes aren't always bad. They can be, but they're not always bad. Expectant hopes probably usually pretty good. But they cannot take the priority, they cannot take the place of our certain hope. Um, uh, Psalm thirty-three, eighteen. Psalm 33, 18. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who who hope in his steadfast love. Okay? Um, That word hope is the certain hope. Okay? Um, So he's saying, uh, 18, so uh, he's saying, uh, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him and on those who hope in his steadfast love. It's those that have have that anchor for their soul. Those, Those that have said, that have cling to this, this, this rescuing, this restoration, this plan of God that is so impacting and evident in my life. Um, uh, That's that hope. And uh, I want to turn to, um, this This will give you a quick contrast. In Proverbs chapter 10, if you want to turn there real quick, I think this is the last passage I'll turn to. Um, Proverbs chapter 10. Verse 28. And this really shows the contrast because um, both of the words, hope, uh, there's two different definitions actually uh, for the word hope in this passage. So uh, Proverbs 10, verse 28. The hope of the righteous brings joy, but the expectation of the wicked will perish. What's interesting about this verse is that word expectation was actually the word hope used other places in the Bible, but they changed that word to make it better in the English language because the word hope was already in there. The first hope in that passage is what? Is the certain hope. 
The second hope, or they changed it to expectation, is a wishful hope. And I just think that's interesting that they, that they did that. Um, where, I'm going to read it one more time if I can find it. Uh, Proverbs 10, 28. Sorry, I lost my spot. Um, the hope, the certain hope of the righteous uh, brings joy. But the expectation or the uh, temporary hopes of the wicked will perish. The ones the, that, that place the, the hopes, the people that place their hopes, their wishful hopes ahead of the hope of the anchor for our soul, they will perish. And you kind of see Jesus' um, heart break in the story that we uh, talked about with, with the uh, royal official's son. He's saying, you, I know you hope for this, and it's not a bad thing, but you're missing something. You're missing it. Yes, I want to heal your son, and that's a good thing. And I want to show my power. And people hopefully will believe through my power displayed, through the healing that I'm going to do in your son. But you're still missing something. Where is your hope? Where is your hope? Where is your hope? All of the earthly hopes will eventually fail, fall short, and end. They all have seasons. There's one hope that does not. We have a hope. He's the hope of glory. We just don't we don't just hope that we can reach heaven one day. Jesus is our hope. It's not a I wonder if this will happen scenario. It's not if I live this way then maybe I'll make it. We know that we're loved by our Father. We know we are sealed in the blood of the Lamb. Jesus went on our behalf. He became the great high priest. He bore our sin and bore our shame. And we are sealed in the blood of the Lamb. And this hope is an anchor for our soul. Meaning, it's the reason I can persevere through the nastiness of this life. It's the reason I have peace and joy in the midst of storms. I can love those who hate me or those who are unkind or unjust to me. Our hope is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Our hope doesn't change. Other hopes have seasons. Other hopes have expiration dates. Ours doesn't. And this is why I live. God gave us hope through his son. And guess what? It's not the hope of a better earthly life. It's not the hope of more money or a better car or more friends or more popularity. Our hope is Jesus. Earthly hopes aren't necessarily bad or wrong, but they are fleeting. Luke 18.1. Um, well, before I go there, I want to tell, tell this quick story, uh, and then I'll be done. Um, last weekend at Unite and Ignite, Jesse Johnson shared this story. And I'm not going to get it exactly right, but I, I'm just going to be super quick with it. Um, Jesse does an amazing job of, um, he works at this uh, school, alternative school called The Crossing in Knox. And every year, he, he invests not just into the school, he invests into the lives of the, of the people that are at this school. And uh, one particular person uh, was struggling in life and he you know, got kicked out of school. I don't remember all the details, but... Um, he was getting a tattoo, and he was talking to Jesse about this. He was going to get a tattoo, and, and the tattoo was going to be no hope. And so Jesse was talking to this guy, I have no hope. I have no hope. Um, and through that process, and I don't even know how long it was after that, but God grabbed a hold of his heart and his life through Jesse and through the ministry of the crossing. And, um, and I, I, it was a while later... Uh, Jesse got in a conversation with him about the tattoo. He says, so you're going to change the tattoo, right? And he's like, no, it's, it's still going to be no hope, but it's going to be K-N-O-W, hope. He said, I used to have no hope, but now I know hope. That's a guy who has his priorities straight. That's a guy who knows that his, the hope is an anchor for his soul. That wishful hopes 
even though they may be good, cannot, must not, take the place of our certain hope in Jesus. <clears throat> so I, um, I'm just going to kind of close here. Uh, and is Josh in here? No? Yeah. I mean, I, we don't need to spend a long time, I, but I did kind of feel like it was important if, you know, if you guys just need to spend a couple seconds even just reflecting, remembering, placing, you know, the hope that, 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 that we have in Christ because of what he did for us. Um, I just thought I'd take a couple seconds. I know it's about five after, um, and you can leave if you need to. I was just going to have Josh play a little bit in the background. Um, and uh, um, John, if it's okay, I'm just going to dismiss people. And if you want to just stay while Josh is playing in the background, just to reflect on the hope that is in Christ. And maybe some of us have um, misplaced, um, misordered where, uh, you know, our priorities of hope. Um, Because it's easy to do. Because it's the enemy's goal to, the little things, to get you to drift away little by little by little and not remember the hope that is an anchor for your soul. And so um, what I'm going to do is... uh, I'm just going to pray as Josh is playing, and, and you guys just leave whenever. You can leave whenever. I just ask that you leave kind of quietly because there might be people here that just want to reflect on that. <clears throat> Let's pray. Lord, we... come back to the place at the cross we remember God that you did something that no one else could ever do you you provided for us something that no one else could provide you bore our sin You gave us life. You gave us, provided access to the Father through our filth, our our dirty choices, through our sin. You somehow made a way for us to come back into fellowship with a perfect and holy God. And God, we are grateful. Father, we are so thankful. And Father, I pray that you would forgive us for where we have placed uh, more importance on what you can do for our lives temporarily than what you've already done in our lives permanently. Forgive us, God. Father, I pray if there's anyone in here, God, that that has misplaced those priorities. God, I pray that we would be able to right now fix it by the power of your Holy Spirit. If you want to just stay in here and reflect, if you want to leave, you're more than welcome to be dismissed. Just I encourage you to please do it quietly. Thank you.